So as Matthew said, today we're going to be talking about Laurelvan and also uh, Laura, which is used by Laurelvan. So what are these technologies? Well, in short, um, Laurelvan is a network technology built on top of Laura, which is a um, physical layer. So we can see Laura as the uh, lowest layer in the OC network stack. It's the physical layer, so it's how we send the messages. And then Laurelvan on top of that adds networking features. So before we get into the um, specifics, we all should, uh, I want to do a quick motivation just to sort of give you an idea why these things are useful. So this might be a bit of a specific example, but I still think it, it illustrates quite well um, why we're doing this. So you could imagine that um, maybe you're like a scientist or something like that, and you've decided that you want to um, create a new sensor of some sort, and you come up with something like a soil sensor that measures the uh, health or similar of like um, plants. And so you decide to create a device there that you want to be able to deploy. You want it to be battery powered and you want it to deploy its data wirelessly. And so let's say for the first test, you run it on your house plant inside your house. And so for broadcasting the data wirelessly, in this case, using something like Wi-Fi makes really good sense, right? Because chances are in, it's if it's in your house, you already have a pretty good Wi-Fi connection. So we can then imagine that this is a success. Your device does exactly what you want it to. And then you move on to the uh, the back garden. And already here, you're probably starting to run into some problems. So um, if, if it's a big back garden, mind you. So the issue here is that if you still continue to use Wi-Fi, uh, typically Wi-Fi has a range of around 50 meters or so. And if you combine that with something like thick brick walls or like a concrete house or similar, the range will actually drop even quicker than that. And it will also get unstable way before you reach the maximum. So already here, you're likely to run into some problems. And then you can also imagine that even then, if your sensor continues to work good, you get called up by your local farmer asking if you can install them across this field that maybe spans uh, multiple kilometers in both directions. Now, if you tell them that you can do this, but at the same time, you need to set up Wi-Fi routers every 50 meters or so, he's uh, likely to hang up the call. So instead, we, we need a different approach for this, right, than in using something like Wi-Fi or even worse, something like Bluetooth. So what we're interested here is what is conceptually called an LP van, which stands for Low Power Wide Area Network. And this sounds exactly like what we need, right? We want something that is a low power, so we can use it on our battery uh, powered sensors. And we want it to be wide area, so we don't have to deploy like gateways every 50 meters or so. So this almost sounds too good to be true, right? Like it's both low power and wide area, but it's actually um, very doable. And the idea is that by doing some modifications on the OCI stack on some of these layers, we can achieve this and the main idea is that we can make some modifications on the physical layer, mainly by um, reducing the bit rate. So the amount of data that we send per second, we can actually get um, much wider coverage and lower power usage. Um, reducing the bit rate also means that uh, LP WANs are not really that useful for consumer hardware, since typically we'll use that for something like internet browsing or watching videos. And LP WANs will typically not at all have the bit rate necessary for this. So we'll get into how we can do this. And it's also worth mentioning that with a uh, lower bit rate, we'll usually have to modify the layers on top to sort of accommodate this. So this is what we want to do, right? So in this talk, I want to get give an idea of how we can actually do it. So to figure that out, we'll start by going back to the basics of wireless communication. So how does wireless communication work? Well. In the, uh, in the case of like electronics, right, we do it by sending electromagnetic waves. This is not necessarily like the only way we can communicate wirelessly. Like right now I'm doing it to you using sound waves, but in our case, we're just interested in doing it via electromagnetic waves. And at the basis of all electromagnetic uh, wave communication, there's of course the humble radio. And the idea here is we want to transmit information from one radio and have it received by another. So if we start by looking at a transmitter, so a radio that generates a signal, the idea is that the transmitter will generate sort of a base signal, as you can see here, with a given amplitude and a given frequency. So the idea is that this wave on its own doesn't really carry any information. 
but that we can encode information in it. And the way we do that is by modulating it. So up here, I've given two examples of how we can modulate a wave. One way we can do that is by modulating the amplitude. So by either increasing it or so, or decreasing it. So an example of how we could modulate information this way is saying something like a high amplitude encodes a one and a low amplitude encodes a zero. Now, this is actually a viable way on its own to send information. For very long distances, it's proven to be um, not as useful since typically the amplitude will drop quite rapidly when we're sending over very far distances. For something like, like Wi-Fi, this might be a viable technique, but for very long distances, the amplitude will typically drop when the wave is reflected off of something or it passes through a material. So another way we can set modulate information is through the frequency. So we can either increase the frequency as so, or we can decrease it. And then again, right, like imagining the pattern here for modulating um, information this way is quite easy, right? Like one very trivial example would be to say that a high frequency like this encodes a one and a low frequency encodes a zero. And the good thing about frequency is it remains more or less constant for waves, even over very long distances, right? You have to like go to almost astronomical distances before the wave, uh, the frequency starts changing. So this has um, proven like uh, frequency modulation has proven a very useful method for sending messages over long distances. So we can go into the next slide here. So this was the uh, viewpoint from the transmitter. Now looking at the viewpoint from the receiver, in a perfect world, right, the receiver would only be receiving the signal that we're sending out. But in reality, we're always surrounded by a ton of different electromagnetic signals and also just a ton of noise and electromagnetic background radiation. But the good thing about the receiver is we can actually take a signal like this and then split it into its components. How this works, I won't go into in this talk. It's a whole subject on its own. But you just have to like accept the idea that we can take a signal like this and then split it into the uh, different frequencies that it consists of. So this is a bit of a toy example. In reality, a wave like this would be composed of more or less all frequencies you can imagine. It's just that the amplitude for most of them would be really, really low. So an example of that here, right? Like this signal is mainly composed of this frequency here, but it also has a smaller part of something like this here. The important thing is when we split it into its component, we preserve the amplitude. So we know which signals we're getting, like which frequencies we're getting that are powerful, and we know which are, uh, have a low amplitude. So this, again, this is a toy example. In, the rea in reality, we can do something like this. So the idea is that given an incoming wave, we can map all the frequencies to their amplitude. So for the example before, right, we just had three frequencies. In this example, we're mapping all frequency uh, from some like given bandwidth here. And then we're mapping them over time to their amplitude. So in this case, we draw a really high amplitude as yellow and a really low amplitude as dark blue. So maybe it's intuitive to you now, or maybe not, but the idea here is that if we send a signal with a given frequency, right, and a decent amplitude, it will appear as a straight line if we keep the frequency constant. But if we then start to modulate the frequency, we can either move the line upwards or downwards, and in this way, basically draw a pattern that the uh, receiver will be able to, to pick up on. And this is the idea behind frequency modulation. And so an example of that here is I have this uh, wave here that I'm transmitting, and it's probably not, uh, it's a bit hard to see here, but the, 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 the way that the frequency is changing here is actually following a sign function. So that means when we pick this signal up by a receiver, we'll actually end up drawing like a, a sign function over time here, right? So hopefully now it, it, it makes sense that by sending out a signal and then modulating the frequency like this, we can transmit information to the receiver. And this is the like the base idea of LoRa. LoRa is in itself a um, based on frequency modulation. So now we have the tools we actually need to, to get into how it works. So LoRa is based on something called chirp modulation, which is a type of frequency modulation. What I've drawn here, again, is a spectrogram. So on the uh, y-axis, we have the frequency, and on the x-axis, we have the time, and then we, um, we sort of like map the, uh, the frequencies to the amplitude here. And so the idea in chirp modulation is that we start at a given, um, we uh, start at a given bandwidth, and then we 
always increase the frequency or decrease it, but we always do it at a constant rate. So that's why we get this straight line here. So in chirp modulation, we always add a fixed uh, frequency as well with a given bandwidth. So for LoRa, um, the frequency is actually region dependent. In, uh, in Europe, we typically use 868 megahertz, but in uh, the Americas and in Asia, we'll use different ones. And then the bandwidth here varies as well. So uh, for a given signal, we'll, we'll start at like some low frequency and then go to the highest. So this is what we call the bandwidth, this like interval here. So the idea in LoRa is that um, we send the messages as packets, right, as we do with most networks. And the idea in LoRa is that each packet starts with 10 op chirps here. So this is a sketch of the spectrogram, by the way. You imagine, again, the frequency is here on the y-axis, and this is the time axis. So we start with 10 op chirps, and then we follow it by two down chirps here. So again, the up chirps would go from uh, a low frequency to the highest frequency, and then we go down again to the lowest frequency and to the highest frequency in the given bandwidth. So this is just a sketch, right? Here is a real world example. So I pulled the signal from some uh, samples I found online and then um, map it, map the frequency on this spectrogram here using Python. There's people that can do it, so it looks way cooler than what I've done here. But hopefully you can still see that these are sort of like up chirps. So moving from the lowest frequency right to the highest, and we got 10 of them followed by two down chirps. And then we got like some weird stuff over here. And what that stuff is, is the data. So right now, this is just the packet beginning. It doesn't actually encode any information. So now we can move on to how we do that in LoRa. So the idea in LoRa is to, um, to send data. We actually just keep sending these up chirps. But what we do for each op chirp is we phase shift them as so. So what I did there was that I just changed the face of them. And what that means is that instead of starting at the lowest frequency, we start at some specific frequency for each chirp. And then we move to the highest frequency and we drop to the lowest and continue until we've covered the entire bandwidth. So the idea here is that each of these chirps here encode a piece of information. And the information that they encode depends on what frequency they start on. So we can move on to talk about how that works. That depends on something called the, uh, the spreading factor. So the spreading factor is a bit of a complicated term in LoRa because it actually encodes multiple things. But um, the first thing we'll discuss that it does is that given a spreading factor of n, we divide our bandwidth into two to the n power buckets. So you can see here, I've, I've selected a spreading factor of three. That means that we've divided this um, bandwidth into eight buckets here. And so the way that we um, see what value these encode is that we say that each chirp here encodes a symbol. And the symbol that they encode depends on the bucket that they sort of start in, right? So we can read that the first chirp here encodes a symbol with value two. The next one here encodes a symbol of value three. This one a symbol of value four and so on. So yeah, I hope this makes sense. It's a bit of a simplified example because in reality, we wouldn't just read the symbol. We do some um, multiplication on these frequencies to figure out which frequency they start at. But uh, for all intents and purposes, this is what's happening in LoRa. Um, so yeah, we can also change the spreading factor. So if we increase the spreading factor by one, right, we uh, double the amount of buckets in each chirp. And what this gives you is that each symbol can encode one more bit of information. Um, but I mentioned before that the spreading factor encodes multiple things. And what it also does in LoRa is that every time we increase the spreading factor by one, we also have the symbol rate. So how many symbols we're sending per time. So what this means, maybe a bit counterintuitively, is that if we increase the spreading factor, what actually happens is it takes more time to send a piece of information, because even though we get one more bit per symbol, the um, the time per symbol is half. So you can see that the bit rate actually drops exponentially. On the other hand, though, if we increase the spreading factor, that means that we get more time per symbol. And this means that um, we require less sensitivity to pick these signals up, so we'll be able to broadcast them over longer distances. So yeah, quickly mentioning as well, um, 
there's a few other things worth mentioning about LoRa that I won't get too much into here. LoRa is a proprietary technology. It's not open. So there's a few things like uh, they have a uh, correction algorithm. So they send, I think, like roughly one half or five eighths of the bits sent by LoRa are actually error correction bits, like the ones we've had mentioned in the network course. And also there's some stuff around bit shifting. So they'll, they'll uh, like shift the bits around according to a certain pattern, which is proprietary. So a quick example of what kind of range you can get with LoRa. As I mentioned, um, the spreading factor sort of tells you how much range you can get. Since the higher the spreading factor is, the more time you send per symbol, so the easier it is to pick up. In this example here, I, I tied a gateway to my house uh, back in Denmark to the roof and then drove around in the car with a transmitter like this. And I was able, under very ideal conditions, to get a range of about 10.1 kilometers. This was using a spreading factor of 12. So that means that uh, for the simple message I was sending, I was just sending a hello world, so 11 bytes. The uh, time for this to take was um, more than two seconds. So you can imagine it's not quite useful for something like browsing or, or YouTube or anything like that, but it's very useful for long distance sensors. So yeah, that's LoRa. Um, now we sort of understand how this technology works, but it's not really a full network technology in itself. It's just a, a way to broadcast information. So if we want a full network technology, we'll have to um, discuss LoRaWAN, which is an open network technology built with LoRa as the physical layer. So if we bring back our old friend here, the, um, the OC stack, as mentioned, LoRa exists here on the physical layer and LoRaWAN takes care of the network and the data link layers. So the uh, LoRa Alliance are sort of the guys that handle LoRaWAN and all the standards behind it. They're there to sort of uh, keep things standardized and also um, try to spread uh, LoRa, LoRaWAN around the world. Uh, the idea here is that if you look at the companies in the LoRa Alliance, usually they just work on one part of the stack. So maybe there's companies working on sensors and they then depend on other companies doing things like gateways and, and making sure that there's coverage. So the reason for the Alliance is really sort of to create this symbiotic relationship between the companies. Some companies in the Alliance that are worth mentioning is that um, Alibaba and Amazon are a part of it. Now we can move on to what LoRaWAN actually is. So among other things, it prescribes its uh, topology for your network. So a LoRaWAN network consists of multiple end nodes, which are drawn here, uh, multiple gateways, uh, a network and an app server. So we'll get into how communication works over this. So if we start by focusing on the node, typically it will be battery powered. As the example I gave before with the uh, soil sensor, that was definitely the case. But we actually divide them into different classes based on their power requirements. So I'll get into a bit more later why that's important. But for now, you just can imagine that a node is basically anything that you want transmitting information to your gateways. So the way addressing works in LoRaWAN is that each end node is assigned a device EUI, which uniquely identifies it. So it's a bit like a MAC address. Then it's also assigned a device address, which is like an IP address um, in the normal network stack. It's non-unique. And then you also have the app EUI, which identifies something called a LoRaWAN application. So the idea behind applications in LoRaWAN is that we want uh, a single network to be able to support multiple applications. And an application in this case could be something like uh, a soil sensor network and maybe a power meter network. And the idea is that one network should be able to have multiple applications. It's also worth mentioning that these addresses here are assigned by the LoRaWAN Alliance, so they can give different companies different prefixes uh, for their devices. And next, moving on to the gateway. Um, compared to the node, it's a bit more complicated hardware-wise. Typically, a node will only have a single radio, so it can either have an uplink or downlink. Whereas a radio will have multiple, sorry, a gateway will have multiple radios all listening at the same time. Once the gateway picks up a, a LoRa packet, it will just forward it directly to the network server bit by bit. And so this means it has both a LoRa based and a traditional physical layer, right? So it'll be listening uh, with LoRa antennas and then transmitting the information using something like Wi Fi or LAN cable. And then moving on to the network and the app server. So they handle things like message duplication. This happens on the network server. 
if multiple gateways pick up the same message, the network server makes sure that it only forwards one. It also handles downlinks. So if we want to send a message down to the node, we do this through the network server. And the app server then handles uh, the message once we receive them. So they do things like decryption, and they also handle uh, keys and encryption of the messages. So here's a quick example of how an uplink works in Laravan. A device will wake up and then broadcast the message via Laura. It will be picked up by the um, by the gateway, which will then in turn broadcast it to the network server. Usually the network server waits for a bit to see if other gateways have sent the message. If not, uh, it will just pass it on to the application server where we can sort of do whatever we want with the uh, with the message. And the next thing we can do is a downlink. So an uplink is a message being sent from the end node to the application server. A downlink is the opposite. A message is being sent from the application server to the end node. And the idea here is this is a lot more complicated because we want to accommodate the different power uh, usages of the end nodes. So I mentioned that before, right? We divide them into classes. We have a class A, a class B, and a class C. So the case in the class A devices, we only send um, downlink messages right after it's done an uplink. So right after it's sent an uplink message, it will listen for a brief moment uh, if any downlinks are coming. And if not, then it will just close down. So this means if we want to send a message to a class A device, we have to schedule it in advance. And then as soon as the network server receives the message from a class A device, it will hurry and then send the message back. So basically it provides no guarantee of when the message will arrive in the class A case. Class B extends this pattern but also adds these timed listening windows. So this gives us at least a guarantee of when we will receive the message, but it also takes more power, right, to have all these listening windows. And then class C is definitely the most power hungry. Anytime it's not doing an uplink, it's listening, but this also has the benefit that it has the low, lowest latency, but it's not really fit for something like um, a battery usage. And then also a quick mention of how we do encryption in Laravan. We do this with a protocol called OTAA. So how that works is that um, when an end node wakes up, it sends a join request to the network, usually with its app key attached and also its uh, device EUI. This is then picked up by a gateway, hopefully, and forwarded to the network server, where the server will evaluate the join requests. And if it matches, if it recognizes the device as one of its own, it will send something called a join accept with a device address and also the keys needed for encryption. This is then sent by a downlink. Um, and once the device picks it up, it can start broadcasting. So this here means that um, this protocol here makes Laravan a lot safer than just doing something basic like um, just baking the encryption key right into the device. This that, that wouldn't really be safe. All right, so that was small as Laravan. We can now move into talking about Laravan in practice. So, um, I've brought up a few examples here of LoRaWAN networks. So in some countries, they've actually outfitted their cellular towers with gateways. So this means that they get something like 90% coverage in the entire country. But to use these gateways, you'd probably have to call up the cellular company. Um, most of us are not quite lucky to live in countries like this. The UK is one of those. So for that, we have the Things network, which is an open network based on LoRaWAN. And by open here, I mean that you can connect all your own devices to it, both end nodes and gateways. And the idea is if you connect a gateway to it, you can then use that and they provide a free uh, network server and application server. But you will also uh, basically like your gateway will also be usable by other people. So if your gateway is nearby and someone else is using the Things network and broadcasting messages, your gateway will also be available to them. The, on the flip side, you can also use other people's gateways. So that this basically means that you have a free network you can connect to any time. If you don't like the idea of using someone else's network and application server, you can download something like ChirpStack, which is a Go-based uh, network and application server that supports most features of LoRaWAN. Here, the issue is uh, this is not very fun unless you have all the hardware yourself, right? Because you're not going to be able to use this unless you connect both a gateway and an end node, at least. And then on the topic of gateways, these are pretty readily available to buy. The Things Network produces a pretty cheap one you can buy. You can buy them down for around 50 pounds or so. And you can even build your own for maybe like five pounds or so with a single channel. These will miss some messages in LoRaWAN, but um, 
in general, they're pretty good for testing. And then on the topic of LoRaWAN nodes, you can buy them pre-built, like the GPS track over here. You can buy like pre-built boards that are easy to program, um, a bit like an Arduino with all the features built in. Or you can just buy the antenna board as an example given here, right? And just sort an antenna and then connect it to an Arduino or whatever, and then do what you want with it. So I hope oh, that you can still see my screen now if I move to the next tab. So I'll give a quick demo. I think I'm running out a bit of time, so I'll try to do it as fast as possible. So this is the Things Network here, and I have a list over my applications. If I go onto um, my uh, application here that I've called Cam Talk Demo, I can then go into my devices and I've registered one called the Demonstration Board. So this is the one I'm holding here. So under here, I got all the information about my board. So now, crossing my fingers that this works, I can go under the data here, and if I do a quick refresh, you can see there's some old messages there, and then press the uh, button on my device here. Hopefully, it should broadcast the message. We'll see if this works. If not, well, it is what it is. Oh, there we go. Feeling quite lucky. So if we then go under the message here, it's broadcasted by this board, right? Then we can see that there's some metadata about it. And we can see under the gateways field here that it's actually being picked up by two gateways, which is quite cool. So I don't own any gateways. Um, I just, I'm in Cambridge at the moment. So if I go to the Things Network here and then um, go on the Things Network slash map, I can actually see a map uh, of all the gateways they've registered on there. And if I move to Cambridge here, oh, it's a bit slow. There we go. We can see that we actually have some uh, gateways spread out over the city. Um, if I had to guess, I would say this message is probably being picked up on by something like the gateway here at the uni library, or maybe the one at the computer lab. All right, so that was it for the demo. Then we'll do a quick conclusion. So in conclusion, the most well-known wireless technologies have some limitations that we can in some cases solve by using LPVAN. We can um, transmit information by modulating radio waves and then demodulating the signal. And then LoRa works by sending chirps with different offsets. LoRaWAN is a network structure built on top of LoRa, and it's easy to get started yourself. You can buy these things and then connect to an open network, and then you're ready to play. And yeah. Quick shout out to the icon makers and thank you for listening and I think I'm ready for questions.